right now on the National Weather Desk. Three years later, looking back on a devastating tornado outbreak and its impact on an Alabama community. When I got on my knee, I said, Lord, please let it pass over. Plus, we're busting common myths people still believe about twisters. We'll see how California will use AI to battle wildfires. This will allow firefighters to respond to a fire quicker than ever before. And extended coverage of next month's total solar eclipse from the bats in Texas. Something interesting to see how the animals react. To making sure your eyes are protected. Is the false sense of security that ultimately really matters. And helping you get the perfect eclipse photos. Without the filter, you can cause significant damage to your camera. From our nation's capital, this is the National Weather Desk. Good morning and welcome to the National Weather Desk. I'm meteorologist Mark Pena. A light snow continues to fall on Duluth, Minnesota this morning, culminating of days of snow. The city of the city on the shores of Lake Superior could see another two inches between now and tomorrow morning, and that's on top of two feet that fell over the past 72 hours. That is by far the largest snowfall of the winter there. The entire state of Minnesota is far behind its annual average snowfall, too. Three years ago this week marks a time of devastation in Alabama. On March 25th, 2021, 11 tornadoes touched down across the state and one was on the ground for more than 90 minutes and left a 80 mile long path of destruction. Valerie Bells looks back at the damage and how people got their lives back together. We've had tornadoes before, but not loss of life. It was bad. And for that reason, March 25th, 2021 will be a day this community will never forget. Uh, that tornado is right on top of Ohatchee right now. Uh, it's uh, not a good look right there. That's a very dangerous storm. Remnant by the damage that remains three years later, after an EF3 tornado ripped along Grayton Road South. Well, I was kind of nervous and scared, but I, when I got on my knee, I said, Lord, please let it pass over. And it did. Everything was gone. But this statue that belonged to his wife who passed in 2014, remained untouched. Angela Bowers lives across the street and relives that day. All of us lost everything we had and family. Bowers survived the storm in her car. She was trying to seek shelter at the high school nearby, but never made it. We were trapped and she was only a year old. When she was able to get back to what was once home. They would met me telling me that they found my niece, Evanique. Harris body. Her sister Barbara Harris and brother-in-law Willie Harris also died that day. Although they've decided to rebuild, Bowers says it's been a slow progress. But there is something the wrath of Mother Nature can't take. We do have memories. Unfortunately, there are too many myths about tornadoes that people still believe. Iowa meteorologist Matt Gunn helps separate facts from fiction. There are still some myths of tornadoes that continue to be spread. Some of the most common are that tornadoes can't cross bodies of water. They never strike cities twice. It's safe to take shelter underneath an overpass or bridge, and they do not hit large cities. These myths are all false. Tornadoes can and do travel across bodies of water. Some even form on water. Those are called water sprouts. Twisters can strike at any time, and that means that, yes, they can hit the same location more than once. Overpasses act as a strong wind tunnel, which may cause even more debris to be flying around, thus causing you more harm. The last myth I'll speak on is that tornadoes don't hit big cities. Tornadoes do not care about the size of the city they hit. They can happen at any point during the year and hit any city during the year. Artificial intelligence is now being used to detect wildfires before they grow out of control. The new technology is going to be in full force this summer for the very first time. Anissa Martinez has a look at how the tech is replacing outdated practices. And what's great about it is uh, the AI is able to pick up um, an anomaly or a smoke uh, in over uh, 1,000 cameras statewide in that camera view. This will allow firefighters to respond to a fire quicker than ever before. The cameras have been used by fire personnel for years, but they have never had this level of real-time mapping. What's different about this is we don't have enough personnel to monitor all 1,000 cameras 24-7. Uh, and what the AI is doing, it's doing that for us. So it, it is looking at 
all of those views 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and any anomaly or smoke that it detects, uh, it alerts our uh, Intel Operations Center, which then alerts the appropriate command center. It is a major advancement for fire prevention. Before now, firefighters relied on lookout towers to spot and relay potential fire locations. Those would be staffed during the day with real people and they would look around and spot smokes and or wildland fires. They had a 360 degree view, but uh, they had to look at that uh, basically all the daylight hours. Um, they were not there during the night. It was hard to see a smoke uh, or detect a smoke at night. Uh, and again, we only had a few of those towers statewide. The primary goal for this new innovation is to detect the start of a fire as early as possible and preventing a spread. In the last seven years alone, there have been around 50,000 wildfires in California that have burned over 11 million acres and resulted in nearly 200 deaths. This new AI technology is the first step in preventing that level of destruction from happening again. Now, severe weather this week in Nebraska hasn't stopped ranchers from braving 60 mile per hour winds to make sure their cattle are safe. In fact, as Steve White found out, the snow is actually a welcome sight. Winds howling more than 60 miles an hour in central Nebraska, where ranchers battle blizzard conditions in the midst of a calving season that until now brought mild weather. It's been pretty blessed. Lately, so we figure something be coming. Trey Van Slyke says his family runs about 800 cattle, and calving season is pretty intense. A feeling amplified when babies arrive in the snow. We're probably around a dozen today, so it's just main things getting them up, getting them cloths from them, keeping them warm. So. Trees and structures provide wind breaks, and as he drives to check cattle, you can see the difference it makes. The wind's sure blowing, and the snow is moving a lot. It just keeps drifting, so. Colder like this, it's a little more difficult. Uh, you just gotta get up early, make sure everything gets up and moves around, and make sure everything's bedded down and warm. As Dalton Lewandowski heads out into muddy, windy conditions, utilities battle it too. Our, our linemen seem to thrive on that. Howard Greenley with a significant outage. We had about 1,300 customers off, uh, found some issues up just uh, east of Greeley and uh, our guys were out, did some switching, and uh, currently we have everybody back on and uh, good to go. Drought and high feed costs have resulted in the nation's smallest cattle herd in nearly 75 years. Weather like this can impact a producer's financial success, but those are discussions for another day as ranchers protect that investment in difficult conditions. And now to the mountains of western North Carolina, where spring brings an increase in bear sightings, which means more bear, vi bear videos are circulating. The viewers sent these to our Asheville station. This one was spotted in Montford, North Carolina. This bear is full grown, but you're also likely to see adolescent bears on the move as well. So you're probably going to see uh, what they call yearling bears, bears that were cubs last year. They're going to be a little bit bigger now. They're going to be probably somewhere in the neighborhood of, of a few hundred pounds out looking for their own territories. Experts say it is normal to see bears roaming as they search for food. In warmer climates like western North Carolina, bears do not go into full hibernation like they do in much colder areas. But they are, they are emerging from their dens, most of them with new cubs in tow. Now let's check, the, let's check to see the weather in cities across the country today. We start in Orange Park, Florida, a suburb of Jacksonville. There's a marginal risk of severe storms today. Cloudy skies this morning could give way to thunderstorms this afternoon as highs approach 80 degrees. Next, we head to northern New England and Vermont's Burke Mountain Ski Resort. Today, they are skiing on 60% of their trails, but conditions will worsen with a chance of showers and temperatures in the 40s. And this is Cleveland, Ohio, on the shores of Lake Erie. Sea Town is looking at cloudy skies today with a high of 46 degrees. And finally, we head to the gateway to the west, St. Louis. If you look carefully, you can see the arch in the distance. St. Louis, St. Louis will see partly cloudy skies today with highs in the mid 50s. And coming up on the National Weather Desk, we take an in-depth look at the eclipse across America. Among the topics we address, the impact on animals, how to make sure you have the uh, proper eye protection.
I'm meteorologist Charlie Lopresti with a look at the Northeast. We have another wide range in temperatures on the way in the Northeast. For today, temps will be in the 40s and low 50s. They're most in New England. Parts in northern New Jersey, southern New York, and western New York will top out in the 50s and low 60s. We've had that onshore wind. Notice a little bit of rainfall. That's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Skies are brightest in western New York. Uh, I think most of New England will keep some steady rain on Thursday. I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Bailey. Here's a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. We're going to be tracking rainfall as we head into Wednesday with scattered showers. Thursday, more of the same, but even more widespread coverage. We'll likely see this continuing all the way until Thursday evening, and then we'll finally dry out on Friday with a much higher increase in winds. Temperatures will hit around the 50s on Wednesday. We'll get close to 60 degrees for your Thursday. I'm meteorologist Charlotte Carl. Good morning. We have a warm day ahead of us for the Florida Peninsula. Everyone to the north and west of that frontal boundary will see closer to seasonable temperatures. We have the 60s for most of the northern southeast, 59 in Memphis, cool spot, and then we have the 80s in Florida. That frontal boundary will continue to track to the south and east throughout the day. We will see some development in terms of a low pressure system over the Carolinas. Very dense cloud cover in addition to isolated and scattered showers. Welcome back to the National Weather Desk. We continue our countdown to the solar eclipse across America, now less than two weeks away. We are dedicating the next eight minutes to the celestial event. We begin in Central Texas, where officials will be monitoring bats to see how they react to the sudden loss of light. Betty Cross is in Austin with that story. Every night, this is the jaw-dropping sight at Bracken Cave on the outskirts of San Antonio. Fran Hutchins is the director of Bracken Cave Preserve. The population at its peak is around 20 million bats. That's about 18 million more bats than fly out from Austin's Congress Avenue Bridge to grab dinner. So Congress Avenue Bridge is the largest urban colony of bats. These giant roosts make Central Texas the ideal spot to monitor the reaction of bats and the animals that prey on them during April's total solar eclipse. At Bracken Cave, Hutchins and other experts will be walking the perimeter, monitoring any change in behavior. But since the bats are underground, they're less likely to notice the moon completely blocking the face of the sun. Where scientists think there could be a bigger reaction is downtown Austin. The bats roosting here underneath the bridge are more likely to notice day is temporarily becoming night. Experts aren't sure what the nocturnal bats will do, but the possibilities range from not noticing to becoming confused, anxious, or even flying out to see what the fuss is all about. NASA is also curious, and not just about bats. The Eclipse Soundscapes Project will monitor atypical animal behaviors in Central Texas and along the entire eclipse path. They're recording insect, animal, birds, and the bat sounds before, during, and after the eclipse to see if there's any changes in behavior. Experts say don't be surprised if humans have a more impressive reaction than bats that could possibly snooze through it. 
Now, we've mentioned many times uh, the importance of wearing proper eye eyewear during the eclipse. And now officials are warning that fake eclipse glasses are on the rise. Knowing the difference between the real ones and the fake ones could prevent eye damage. Liz Bonus explains. When it comes to your eyes and what you'll see on the day of the eclipse, you get one pair and no spare. So in this case, it really is buyer beware. When it comes to total solar eclipse, uh, even though the sun's going to be mostly blocked, uh, there are still UV rays coming down. And so if you look directly into them, it can damage your retina. Yao Jin is an associate professor of supply chain management at Miami University. He says counterfeit viewers, as they are appropriately called, are not necessarily easy to spot. Well, it's helpful to look at this ISO stamp and information, which means they do offer proper protection. Mr. Jin says even the certifications on some of them can look like the real thing when they are not. It's the false sense of security that ultimately really matters. So in addition to the certification stamp to protect your eyes properly, two other things need to be considered. Where you buy them and who makes them. For an approved list of both. The American Astronomical Society has a list of recommended solar eclipse viewers. In addition to this list, most retail stores pre-certify, and you also lower your risk of getting a counterfeit pair if you buy direct from a manufacturer as opposed to a third-party seller online. When it comes to your eye health, it is not worth it to try to save a buck or two, even if you're only going to use the Eclipse Viewer once. He says if you must buy from an online marketplace, look for evidence of manufacturer authorization. To find out more about that, you can go online. Now, if you are not able to get the correct eyewear, don't worry. There are things you can do to help get a great viewing of the big events using shadows. Meteorologist Amanda Verer explains on TikTok. Okay, so I'm sure you've all heard about the solar eclipse happening very soon. But if you don't have a pair of certified solar eclipse glasses, you can't look directly at it. So I'm going to show you a couple different ways where you can indirectly view the solar eclipse. We're going to start with the craftier way first. These are some of the items you're going to need, along with a box you have hanging around. What we're making is called a pinhole projector. So you'll see a projected image of what's happening in the sky in your box. So to start, we're gonna cut a small square hole in one of the sides of your box, just like this. Now you're gonna tape a small piece of tin foil over that hole. Now with a needle, pin, or something small, poke a hole through your cut hole where the tin foil meets that hole. Now inside your box, on the opposite wall of where that pinhole is, you're going to tape a white piece of paper. This is now your projector screen. Now we have to make the hole that we're actually gonna be looking through. This small hole can be cut into either side that are next to your tin foil side, just like this. Now you wanna seal up your box because you don't want any other light entering except through the pinhole. Now to use it, you want your back to the sun and you want to view through your peephole. Now, if you don't want to go cutting up boxes, there are a couple other ways where you can view it indirectly. One of those ways is just a hole punched into a piece of paper and the other, a strainer. So to use these backs to the sun and project the shadow onto the ground in front of you. Happy viewing everyone, you don't want to miss it. For many people, the eclipse will be all about the perfect photo. Sarah Converse spoke with an expert to find out what goes into getting that perfect shot and making sure you don't damage your camera or phone while getting it. The total solar eclipse will bring people together from all over the country. Some even chase the solar eclipse for the experience and to capture that incredible shot. Isaac Cruz is the lead of the Columbus Astronomical Society's imagery group. He explains that having the proper equipment is important when capturing the solar eclipse. In the same way that we protect our eyes, we need to protect our equipment. And therefore, we actually use filters to be able to do that. This filters filters 99.9% .9 of, the, of the light, the same way that we actually do with our eclipse glasses. Without the filter, you can cause significant damage to your camera. This is like a magnifying glass. We are concentrating the rays of the sun in one point in your detector. Once that happens, the amount of energy that is being uh, focused on that, on that detector is, is humongous. At that point, your detector is ruined, so you need a new camera. Do not use your solar eclipse glasses as a filter for your phone camera. 
you are still looking at the sun, which can do damage to your eye. You're going to point it to the sun. The sun is right in your face. You're going to be trying to zoom in on the, on the, on the actual sun. So by definition, you're going to be looking at it and so forth. The, the, risks, the risks are really not worth you know, the, the, ability to, the ability to be able to take one image. If you decide to take a picture of the total solar eclipse, Isaac says to give yourself plenty of time, be comfortable with your equipment and be safe. Also, don't forget to enjoy this once in a lifetime event. And stay with the National Weather Desk as we count down the days until the April 8th eclipse. We'll have three hours of live coverage as we track the eclipse from Texas to Maine. We also have an entire playlist dedicated to the eclipse on our YouTube channel. Just search the National Weather Desk and be sure to subscribe. We'll be right back. Well, a very good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael. Still dealing with some chilly temperatures across the upper plains for the day today, but even the southern plains still dealing with some cool temperatures with high temperatures in the 50s at their warmest. Tomorrow, though, we start warming up more. Everyone warmer for the day tomorrow. More sunshine as well on the way. And by the time that we get to Friday, pretty quiet for most of us, however, could deal with a little wintry mix there in North Dakota on Friday. Well, most of us are warming into the 60s or 70s across the rest of the Midwest. Good morning, I'm meteorologist Alex Garcia. Here's a look at your regional weather. It's a little on the cool side, all the way from North Texas back into Oklahoma into Little Rock, into the 30s there, compared to the 60s down deep into South Texas. A low pressure center, a little bit of a disturbance in the air will fire up some scattered showers across Central Texas and into Oklahoma today, but no significant rain expected. Otherwise, another nice morning. I'm meteorologist Alex Garcia. That's a look at your regional weather. Hi there and a good Wednesday morning to everybody. I'm meteorologist Shannon O'Donnell. Out west, we've got some sun making a comeback out of Boise and certainly the case in the Valley of the Sun. 77 today around Phoenix and Tucson. Mid-60s out of L.A. But here comes the next weather maker, a big late March frontal system pushing up the west coast. It will bring quite a bit of rain from Cape Mendocino back towards Seattle and Vancouver. And that's the scene from here. Presented by the National Weather Desk. Blue bonnets are the bell of the ball in Texas these days. The blue bonnet is the state flower and usually blooms from late March to early April. They grow fine on their own. However, they're found along major highways and roads because of beautification programs started in the 1930s. And in central New York, a different scene where these seagulls are, quite literally, having a pretty chill time in the snow. All right, we now want to share some of your photos submitted to our stations via Chime In. Rosita White's got this great photo of a rainbow over Duncan Bay in Sheboygan, Michigan. And a beautiful sunset from just a few days ago. This is in Jonesboro, Tennessee. This was sent to us via Chime In by Sandy Bush. And here is a view of a snow-capped mountains in Payson, Arizona. Payson is a small town that sits almost directly in the middle of the state and had been given the nickname the Heart of Arizona. Thank you, Miranda Hicks, for sending this photo to us. 
And we'd love to share your weather content on air. You can find us on all of your social, favorite social media platforms, including Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. Just search the National Weather Desk, and we'll be right back. Thank you for joining us tomorrow on the National Weather Desk. Play ball. We'll see how the weather could impact opening day for Major League Baseball. I'm meteorologist Mar Pena. Make it a great Wednesday, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.